Today, we're privileged to have an expert who has truly mastered the art of global marketing and brand strategy. She started her journey with a master's degree in public and organizational relations and went on to design impactful digital strategies for prominent brands like Pernod Ricard in New York City and Seoul and South Korea. Her career has been a global adventure involving high-profile projects like the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Summer Olympics and the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Fast forward to a cultural role in Hong Kong, where she has been the driving force behind global marketing at the Executive Center, who is a premium flexible workspace provider operating in over 34 countries across the Asia Pacific region. She's not only built the marketing department, but also crafted an entire brand strategy from scratch. A strong believer in organizational culture, she's also an adjunct professor, published author, and a regular speaker at various industry conferences. Her diverse board memberships include Cornet's Global Hong Kong Chapter and the American Chamber of Commerce, Women's of Influence Committee. She's skilled at adapting breath strategies to different cultures, landscapes, and showcases just how well-executed 360-degree marketing strategies can cultivate trust and meaningful interactions between brands and their audiences. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our distinguished guest, Chelsea Perino. Chelsea. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so pleased to have you on board. Um, when I found out you're coming to town, I just had to get you on. Um, obviously, we've known each other for a really long time and we're good friends. Mm. And um, it'd be lovely to talk to you about the co-working world, basically. So if you wouldn't mind just starting and introducing yourself to anyone that's viewing out there about who you are, and what it is that you do. Sure. Well, super excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Chelsea Perino. I'm Managing Director of Global Marketing and Communications at the Executive Center. So co-working space, premium, 180 plus offices in Asia Pacific, founded in Hong Kong in 1994, and really excited to be expanding our presence here in the Middle East. Yeah. And you already have a, a couple of facilities here already, and I understand you're developing another one in Abu Dhabi, so things must be going really well for you guys. Super busy. It's amazing to see sort of the evolution and the adoption of this hybrid model yeah. kind of emerge out of, you know, what was America and then Europe and then APAC and now, you know, kind of globally, right? So the, the opportunities are endless, I would say. Yeah, so flex space, co-working, it's quite a saturated market, isn't it? There's many different players out there. So what separates the executive center from the rest of the bunch? Well, there are a couple of key factors. The first is our network. So we have about 80% MNCs within our portfolio. MNCs. Multinational organizations. I'll try and stay away from um, <laughs> the acronyms. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so multinational organizations. So yep. these are big companies that have a lot of offices that span many geographies. That's our core audience. Um, so the likes of, you know, the Goldman Sachs, the Googles, the uh, Ferraris, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's, that's really important because that, already brings a level of quality, a caliber of clientele that lends to our stability to our reputation as being, you know, really reliable. We've never closed an office because it didn't work. We've only had to close offices because the the landlords wanted the floors back for traditional leases. So wow. we really pride ourselves on, you know, this demand driven approach in terms of our expansion. We don't do ex speculative expansions. So it's really about listening to our clients and our members and understanding, you know, where opportunities are. That's actually why we opened in Abu Dhabi finally. It's because we had such a such a thrust of of interest from our clientele here in Dubai, which mm -hmm. is where our first office was in, in the UAE, yeah. that we said, you know what, we've got to do it. And we're already 100 percent occupied there and looking to grow it, as yeah. you mentioned before. So that's the first. Um, the second is just the infrastructure Right, so we are only in grade A buildings, which obviously is in central business districts, great amenities, developments are you know, top notch in terms of end of trip and just the thought in terms of the, the experience that you have. So that again ties back to why we have so many MNCs that are part of our network because they care about their image, right? They wanna be in a nice building. They wanna be able to welcome their clients into a space that feels professional mm -hmm. where the Wi-Fi is reliable, where they get great coffee. That's possible. I know, can you believe it, right? <laughs> so all of these things are, are are really important to sort of the core of our brand, but I think fundamentally what's the most important is the service element. So mm -hmm. we don't think of ourselves as a real estate company. 
we think of ourselves as a service business that services the real estate industry. And I think that's quite a different sort of approach and perspective because it means we're human centric, right? Mm -hmm. We're always thinking about what do we need to do to make sure that the people in our spaces are really enjoying and being able to utilize the spaces in the most effective way. And, and that's kind of at the core of what we do. And also it's really what drives the evolution of the design in the spaces. Okay. So presumably the, there must be a lot of like feedback that's coming from the end users as well. Tell me about the, the technology that you use there. Is this a survey that you designed yourself or do you use a third party to survey the, uh, the users of the space? All of the above. <laughs> so I think we, we have to think about, you know, the, the multiverse, the ecosystem, right? I don't think that there is one feedback loop that exists anymore. So on the on the personal level, mm -hmm. we have our engagement associates. They're the people that, um, that actually are physically in the offices that act as that in-person point of contact. And our members know that they can come and ask any questions. They can provide any kind of feedback. And we've put together uh, an infrastructure of feedback that, uh, when when that's received from from our team, mm -hmm. it goes into a system so it's archived. All of our members have profiles so we can go and look at what all the conversations are that have taken place over the longevity of their membership. And so that really helps us, you know, identify how to solve problems, how to create better experiences, how to, you know, create personalized experiences, I think is also really important. We do annual member surveys. Mm -hmm. So that's more of a general kind of how are we doing? What opportunities would you like to see? Are there new services that we could provide that would help you do your business better? Um, that's been really interesting because it's actually resulted in the development of new product lines. Yeah. Um, and then obviously we ask a lot of questions about the, the actual physical design of the spaces. So um, is it, are there enough meeting rooms? I mean, that's why we put call rooms in our centers now, right? That's, that's why now our call rooms are actually um, they are designed to be better for virtual experiences, right? So we put ambient lighting in there. It's built in now. So you don't have to come with your selfie light, yeah. you know, to, to look great. When That's you're essential to iron out the wrinkles, I've, I've discovered. This Best lighting is So important. <laughs> exactly, right? So soundproof booths, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's also helped us figure out what the right distribution is in terms of space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're a combination of all of the things that you would think about in a flexible workspace, right? A combination of private meeting rooms, um, the collaborative lounge areas with different kinds of seating arrangements. And then of course the predominant um, piece of our business is the private office piece, right? Um, but it's really helped, th that kind of feedback has helped us figure out what's that perfect distribution of, of space usage. Yeah. Can, can I just ask you, for, for the multinationals you say that attracted to, to using your spaces, is this part of that because they're moving from place to place or they've got people that are moving from place to place and they're, they're happy to have a home in these different places that, are, you know, it's something that they're used to? Yes and, and yes and no. I think that's one of the reasons, right? So when an organization is moving into a new market for the first time, for example, mm -hmm. and they, they've never been there before, right? They don't have contacts locally to be able to set up an office. Maybe they don't have somebody that actually speaks the local language. That's definitely one motivator. Um, but then our goal is that they love being there so much that they just stay, right? So our retention rate is about 2.9 years. So people stay with us for a long time, which is great. Yeah. Um, the other side of the coin is, I mean, have you ever tried to set up your own office? I mean, it's a nightmare, right? It takes yeah. a lot of time. It's not as easy as just buying some chairs, putting some desks in there, bringing people and people will love it, right? You really need to think about how does the space flow? What is the infrastructure that you're putting in there? You know, setting up Wi-Fi, access, all these things that takes a lot of different people. So for, for our clients, they know they can come into a ready-made space that has top-notch infrastructure, that has all of these shared amenities, which is also, I think, part of the, the benefit because now we're really starting to see people think about from a sustainability perspective, using space or taking space that's actually going to be used as opposed to, again, speculating about what space might be needed. Mm. And so things like not having to put boardrooms in your office and pay for that space when maybe you only need a boardroom once a month, yeah. right? You can use our boardroom because we put it in the space and it's getting used by a lot of different companies at the sure. same time, right? So it, it really helps from a from a financial perspective. And of course- It's more sustainable as well. Totally, right? Yeah. It's that shared economy concept. And 
the CapEx pieces also. Yeah. The, the CFOs of, of the world love not having to put the CapEx out there. So the cost is operationalized mm. through the rent. Yeah. So Doug's been delving into booking systems. This is true, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, do you, do you use anything like this and then across your your offices then? Like, how, how are people booking the different spaces? So what kind of software are you using for this? So we actually built our own in-house booking system. So we have the TEC app um, and we've aggregated all of our amenities that are bookable. So that's meeting rooms, that's event spaces. You can even book now through the app. Um, those are the main, um, I would say, amenities that people need to book in advance or call rooms you can use just as part of the service of being part of TEC. And then the lounge areas, same concept, right? You can just pop in there, sit down at one of the tables. Um, so it's the, it's the co-working desks. If you want to book an actual specific desk in a specific location, it's meeting rooms of various sizes and then event spaces. Um, and the whole entire inventory for our 180 plus offices are all within that app. So as a client, both internal or external, um, because our meeting rooms on all of those amenities are also available to people that don't just have private offices with us. So you could come and book a meeting room if you wanted to, right? Thank you. So if I need one, I can get, I get the, uh, but it has to be your app I go on to. And I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, and then of course there are the more sort of traditional ways you can call a center, right? If you're like, I, mm. I really want to, I want to have a meeting in the Abu Dhabi ADGM center. You could just call the phone number and our um, engagement team would help book that for you and tell you the availabilities and the different sizes and stuff like that. So, again, there are a lot of different methods through which you could sure. get in contact. Yeah. But you developed your own app because there wasn't another one that could do kind of what you wanted or it's just more efficient just to build your own? I mean, to be totally transparent, it was the idea was built before I started. And I think the idea was that. There are a lot of different platforms out there, but we wanted it to feel like it was part of the TEC ecosystem. And we have a very specific look and feel and we create a lot of content. So I'm on the marketing team, obviously that's that's my remit and we create tons of different content. So within the app, we've created a place where, you know, we can put different kinds of promotions, different content. If we've done interviews, if we do podcasts, if we, you know, have member benefits, for example, there's a space for all of that to go. And then there's also a directory as well. So we like to think because, again, like I said, you know, the network is really strong with TC. It's one of our big selling points. And so we actually have a directory like a mini LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So if clients want to tap into the TEC network, they can actually go and search in the directory and say, you want uh, a marketing expert, right? You can go in and search for industries. You could say digital advertising or content or marketing, and people are able to tag their profiles with their areas of expertise. So, you know, you go and you search marketing and my profile pops up, right? And somebody goes, okay, cool. I want to contact Chelsea to see if there's a potential collaboration opportunity. So this is a lot wider than just being a booking app then. It started as a booking app. Yeah. And I think that most organizations, that's where it starts because that's the revenue generator, if you think about mm -hmm. it that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it usually starts with the booking as sort of like the action number one. But then for us, it was really important to make it more than that because I think also, at least within our network, not everybody's booking meeting rooms, right? So if we want the app to actually be relevant to that 50,000 group of people that are part of our network, there needs to be more than just booking mm. because otherwise it's just the senior management and the executive assistant, right? And not that many people in between, uh, which is what we found when we first launched. We were like, wait a minute, this is great for like that 2% of our network that's actually booking meeting rooms. What about everybody else? So for a moment, I'd just like to pivot to, to culture and brand, if I may, for a second. Now, for me, an office space is a reflection of the organization's culture. But of course, you have your own design criteria, which, as you've already said, has evolved over time based on the user's needs. But what degree of agency do the companies and the individuals of those companies have around the space that they consume at the executive center? So are they allowed to come in and like change a lot of stuff around, bring in their own furniture, or is it really kind of set? Yeah. Yeah. So both. Um, so the executive center's brand is, you know, it's about service, it's about premium infrastructure, it's about experience. And so the communal areas, the, the things that are shared, we have sort of our own, you know, product guidelines, you know, and design uh, ethos. But one of the things I think is really special about TC is that every single center is different. So when you guys come to our center tonight, you'll see what the Dubai, you know, design looks like. Mm -hmm. If you came into one in Hong Kong, it would look different. Um, and that's on purpose because 
we really recognize this the, the locality of each one of our offices and understand that it's important to reflect what that culture, mm -hmm. to your point, mm -hmm. is, right? But of course, the fundamental sort of floor plate is relatively the same. Like I mentioned, you know, you've got lounge areas, you've got a barista bar, you've got different kinds sizes of meeting rooms. Um, but the private offices are where the creativity really starts to fly, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a blank slate for our clients. Not everybody decides that they want to put their logo on the wall, but if they want to paint it green and put a logo on there, go for it, right? Okay. If they want that all of the offices come with sort of the pre-designed infrastructure mm -hmm. that um, are, you know, ergonomic chairs and high adjustable desks and, you know, little storage boxes. That's kind of the standard for all of our private offices. But I've had clients come in that said, we don't actually want those ones. We've got something else. Um, and really, the, the larger the offices are, the more we see that. So we have something called bulk, bulk off, what we call bulk offices, which are a higher capacity. And many, many times, you know, our, the clients will come in and say, look, we've got We've got global design brand guidelines that we have to adhere to, and we actually help build offices that are basically like mini versions of a head office, for example. Lovely. Yeah. Oh. Um, the, the second thing that's actually really interesting that we're seeing uh, a big evolution in is what we're calling uh, enterprise managed solutions. So this is when you asked earlier, you know, why would a client come and use a flexible workspace? Um, and we discussed, you know, a lot of the reasons why. But what's interesting now is we're seeing big organizations come and say, can you actually build our headquarters, for example, right? And that means, you know, everything from sourcing the building, signing and negotiating the leases with all of the agents and the landlords, um, doing the entire design playbook. And we're talking about offices for like 500 people, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's not a TEC center, it's actually an office just for that one client. Um, and that's, you know, designed within all of the global brand guidelines with very specific tech infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and then manage the whole thing for them. So, so operate it for them as well. Yeah, okay. exactly. And seeing a lot of that, which is really interesting. And I, again, it's because, you know, to try and put together an office that big takes a lot of resources. So if you have a single point of contact with an organization that has so many connections locally, so, you know, and, and economies of scale again, right? So mm. if you want ergonomic chairs, you know, we buy 50,000 of them, right? Yeah. We can pass Guess on that project. benefit down to you, right? Yep. Um, and you only need to talk to us, right? So if you've had feedback on the design, you don't have to deal with, you know, all of the local contractors and procurement and all of that. So... And you have an experience in how offices work, whereas uh, an organization might only do an office, you know, once every several years. So right. you've done tens in, 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 you know, in a much shorter space of time. So, yeah, yeah like exactly. It's good. Mm. Yeah, our first episode was called One Throat to Choke. And that's essentially <laughs> what you guys are, right? Yeah. With this enterprise solution yeah. catering for large organizations. That's really interesting. Mm. Huh. Yeah. I'm trying to think what I would what I would do with something like that. If I was a large company myself, um, are there any other players offering something similar? I think there's a company that begins with W that we'll, we'll not name. <laughs> There's just exist? something similar. Yeah. I've, I've heard some, I've heard some stuff in the news that's not going so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, of course. Listen, it's uh, there's always competition in the market, right? So it's not a totally unique solution. But I think the the benefits that we bring to the table is that level of quality, the relationships that we have. Um, such a spread. I mean, we're we're one of the biggest ones in Asia, right? So yeah. we have a lot of long-standing relationships with yeah. the whole entire corporate real estate community, I guess you could say. Um, and our teams really tap into that to make sure that the solutions that we're providing specifically for the enterprise deals is exactly what the clients are looking for. And as the head of marketing, how are you driving the brand strategy? You're coming up on six years now at the executive center. So how have you how have you changed its DNA and how are you directing it now? I think it's less about changing the DNA and more about building on it and creating the ability to adapt our messaging based off of the market conversations, right? I mean, when I started in 2017, I would still say Flux was fringe, right? Um, and the executive center awareness was really, really low. That's why I was brought on board in the first place. 
Um, there were a lot of reasons for that. Um, the first was that, you know, we're a B2B business. We consider ourselves B2B, right? So there, it, the B&B infrastructure is very different if you're, than if you're selling to a consumer, right? So we want to sell to Google, right? So there's one person that des decides that. That's why we call our clients the actual companies that use our spaces, and the members are the individuals that then, by proxy, get put into our offices and are the ones that are actually using the spaces. Um, and and because we we really want the the executive center to be sort of the facilitator of growth and success for all of the clients that we service, we don't put any branding in our centers, right? Which for for our clients is great because that means if if your client comes in. Our engagement team will say, oh, you're here to see Oliver Baxter from Maven? No problem. And they just assume that that's your office, right? Super successful growth for you, right? Yeah. So amazing. <laughs> um, but from a branding perspective, it's really hard because then people actually oftentimes don't even know that they're in an executive center, mm -hmm. right? So I've had lots of instances where I've been introduced to somebody and I tell them what I do and they say, oh, I've never heard of you before. And I tell them where our locations are. They go, wait a second like that floor in that building, but I but I go to AmCham's office there. I'm like, yeah, they're our clients. They have their office in our building and people are, you know, astonished. I've been I've been to 10 meetings at that building and I always just thought it was XXX client name, right? Mm. Um, so it's about finding subtle ways to kind of incorporate our branding into the physical spaces, but then also relying very much on, you know, different channels. Social, digital, you know, partnerships is a big thing for us um, and, and crafting that message so that people understand how we are different from, you know, the W's out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've personally been involved in a number of initiatives with you guys and doing some public speaking with yourself at a number of executive centers across across Asia. So is that kind of one of the fingerprints of Chelsea, would you say, that you stamped? And are there any other initiatives that you've implemented that I'm just not aware of at this point that you'd like to talk about? Sure. I mean, I think the just changing the mindset of even our teams about how spaces get used is really important. Um, not everybody has the vision. You know, it's it's form for function, right? So when somebody walks into an office space, the first thing they think that space is used for is for office based work and collaboration and all the other things. I'm using office based work as a very big umbrella term. So when you tell somebody, did you know that you could use this lounge for like a really classy networking event, a cocktail event? They're like, mm, I don't get it. So it was really about changing the mindset and showing people that flexibility doesn't just mean I can go from my private office desk to sitting at a lounge. Exactly, right? It's also maybe I want to use this space to create thought leadership, right? And so I think what our team has done has used ourselves as almost the test rabbit to say, okay, we'll do it. We'll show you that it works. We'll create the marketing materials around that. Now you go and sell this, sell the dream to the clients, right? And we've seen a huge uptick in, you know, using our spaces for events. We started building actual event spaces that are, that are separate to the lounge areas into a lot of our different offices because the demand has really increased. Um, again, it also, I think, comes back to our location in most, you know, tier one, tier two, even cities, there aren't a lot of quality event spaces in the CBD, which is where all of our clients are, right? Um, so that's definitely a selling point. I think, um, I think, again, going back to like the evolution of our messaging, you know, when I first started, it was just like, hey, we're here, we're actually really big and we've been around for a long time. So let us introduce to you who we are. That was like phase one. Um, then, you know, phase two was WeWork's enormous implosion from an IPO perspective, which really shook the market. And I think created out totally tons of tons of speculation as to whether or not the industry could make any money, whether or not it was stable and a reliable place to create an office. Because conversely, like if you suddenly have to close your office because you're in a flex provider that is enabled to manage their own space that they're providing. It's a huge, huge burden, really destabilizing, right? So then the narrative shifted to, yes, you can, to all of those questions. Here's the proof. We've been doing this for, at that point, 25 years, right? We're happy to explain how it works. Um, then COVID happened, right, and ruptured everything. Now everyone's going, wait a minute, do we need the office at all? So we were always 
Yes, you need it. <laughs> please. <laughs> please need it. Yeah. No, but I mean, realistically, we never lost faith yeah. um, because because we've always believed that the office is a really important piece of the workplace infrastructure. Um, that being said, we would never ignore the work from home model, right? I, I really feel like the hybrid concept is where we're moving towards, and that's going to manifest itself in a lot of different ways. So that's kind of where we are now, right, which is, saying, hey, as a space consultant, as a service provider, if you are if you have big question marks about what that future of work is gonna look like for your organization and what kind of opportunities have emerged over the past you know, three and a half years and now the emergence out of that, we can help you because we've been doing this for a long time. So COVID's been a big disruptor. Certain players in the market imploding have been a big disruptor. But how specifically does COVID affect the types of designs that you do now in, in your space? Has that changed to adapt to this flex model? Are you increasing the size of your community spaces or your collaborative spaces? Or are you giving even more privacy to those that require it when they're, when they're in one of your offices? Could you talk to that at all? So I think there are a couple of key evolutions that we've seen. The first, like I mentioned previously, are these Zoom rooms for all intents and purposes, right? Um, so a lot more call rooms. So the one person, two person soundproof booths with ambient lighting that make having a virtual call really easy and enjoyable. Um, we didn't have very many of those in our offices at all prior to COVID. And now it's kind of part of the blueprint for every center moving forward. Um, we, we started adding barista bars into all of our centers prior to COVID, but that's also become a fundamental piece of our design. And I don't just mean like a nice bar that has an espresso machine. There's a professional barista that is there that knows your coffee. I mean, it amazes me. Like I, we have, I think, 12 offices in Hong Kong and I pop around to all of them. Um, but some I frequent more than others. And I'll go back to an office after having been gone for, you know, three months and boom coffee's there yeah. and sometimes I've changed my taste and then I'm like oh no I'm not I'm not doing salted caramel anymore I'm drinking vanilla lattes now like yeah. they're like oh sorry you know but it's it's that element of like personalization that I think makes a big difference um we've also added co-working libraries um okay. which is interesting because in our lounge areas we have usually you know different kinds of informal seating we've got little banquette areas where you could put like four or five people um, with a table and you could put laptops on and then we have what we call co-working tables which are big long tables where you can put your laptop and plug in in the center and stuff um, but we actually saw that people were and not just co-working co-working members but our private office members they really like to come out and actually do work in those shared areas mm -hmm. so we've created separate areas that we're calling co-working libraries which actually are a combination of um of different standing desk uh setups and also more of like the call booths and pods and things um and those are really popular so wow. yeah but i would say realistically we haven't COVID didn't necessarily change our design drastically because we've always been really thoughtful about how people are using spaces. So it's more just, you know, evolving what we've been doing um, and, and incorporating new features that, that people are going to be using more of. Mm -hmm. yeah. does, it, does it change from region to region? Is there anything like for this region that changes from sort of the rest of Asia? Or? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, uh, in, in this region, we have prayer rooms, for example. Yes, yeah. um, in, in some of our other offices, we actually have a completely separate pantry area that's specifically for food, for eating, um, particularly in, in places where lunches can be uh, very aromatic. <laughs> what a diplomatic word. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, you know, but, uh, but it's great because people really want to share, you know, that, that mealtime experience yeah. with their coworkers. And sometimes they want to eat in the office. And so that was a piece of feedback that we got where you know, people were saying, you know, wow, it's really, it smells a lot. If you have a ton of people in here all at the same time, mm. eating a lot of hot food. Mm. So we started building separate pantries that, you know, have refrigerators where people can put lunches if they're bringing them from home, which is, uh, popular in some of our regions um so yeah i think that it, it, there are definitely regional differences for sure mm -hmm. have you had the pleasure of working on any co-working flex projects yeah we, we've done a few we've done uh, the wreckers one for the government uh russell kamer that's their largest co-working space up there we've done and then we've done just one just close to here the bureau uh business center which is like the first female focused uh oh, wow. business center cool. So yeah, that's been extremely successful. I guess it attracts a lot of like you know female business leaders and their companies to to the space. Mm -hmm. cool. 
Uh, I love that. Yes. I'm big on women empowerment. That's my like volunteer yeah, yeah, yeah. hat, daughter <coughs> hat. Yeah, it's been incredibly oh, popular. Cool. Yeah, and it's interesting, like how, as you say, how they use the space, and they've they've got Jones and Grocers in there, so it's quite good for it's a communal space where people from the outside can come in, but also all the different companies can can come and you know sit together and mingle in there. Mm. Um, and they've said as well, actually, one of the the best uh, spaces they have is the the event space. That, mm. Yeah, those have become really popular. I think they're even going to increase that. And I think typically event spaces here are generally just sort of quite conventional. So to have them in that kind of environment is quite good. And you've got the Jones and Grocers there and the, and the other different spaces. So, yeah, it's been really successful here. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for for me, because I, I go to a lot of events, right? And I think what people often forget is very rarely can you go to an event for a whole entire day and not need to take a call or write an email or pop out for a 45 minute meeting. And if you don't have the luxury of being in the same hotel, so you can go up to your room to do that, like where do you actually do that, mm. you know? So we've actually seen some really interesting partnerships with, you know, the hospitality around our centers. Cause again, grade A buildings, CBDs, lots of really nice luxury hotels that have big conference facilities that don't have the private environments that are needed for people to, you know, host those smaller networking sessions, for example. So we've worked with some of the different conference groups um, and some of the different hospitalities to say, hey, look, you know, we will extend access to our center, which is, you know, five minutes away. Sometimes you, it's just an overpass, right? Or you walk underneath and then you're in one of our office buildings um, to, to extend that offer to all of the conference attendees, for example. Um, but I've been at a couple of events that are in actual event spaces like what we have. And it's so nice because, you know, the workplace is there as well so you yeah, can kind of yeah. do both that's incredible and yeah i've been in that situation where i've got to jump on a call for maybe it's just 20 minutes and like you said you're in the event space and where are you going to go and then you're looking for a cafe a quiet corner mm -hmm. so it's great to have that on hand yeah. yeah yeah so you said that you you attend a lot of events but it's not just attending you also you're a highly sought after public speaker as well in the industry um and i'm interested to know what kind of I always cringe at the sound of thought leadership because I think there are very few real thought leaders in the world. But let's let's say research and insights that you're working on. Um, is there any heads up that you could give us on any new content that's cooking or anything that's been proved to be particularly popular that you're talking about at the moment? For sure. I think my what I'm most excited about is a confidence based workshop circuit, I guess you could say. Um, I, like I mentioned before, I'm part of a lot of women empowerment organizations in Hong Kong specifically. So I'm the chair of American Chamber of Commerce's Women of Influence Committee and also Urban Land Institute, so a women's leadership initiative for the Hong Kong chapter. And in being a part of those organizations, what I've really noticed is that I think particularly in Asia, there's a huge lack of confidence, particularly within, within women. Um, and it makes me sad because there's so much knowledge and so many successful women out there that just don't feel like they have the platform to put their foot forward or put their hand up and say, hey, I want to be the speaker at that conference, you know, so I'm on a, a, a crusade to rid APAC of mantles. No offense to you guys. This isn't a mantle. I don't I don't qualify this as a mantle. Um, but yeah, I think that there's this perception that it's really hard to get quality women speakers and it's just not true so i have a lot of initiatives that are connected to that you know building the confidence creating connections between different women particularly within the real estate industry but also in hong kong as well amcham is agnostic industry agnostic um and then using that as a platform to then reach out to all of these different organizations that are hosting you know panel sessions big conferences every size to say hey look there's a resource here for you you can come to us um, and, and we will be able to give you contacts to really qualified women leaders. Because I know for myself when I first moved to Asia, it was really hard to, to build the credibility. You had to hustle and you had to be confident and put yourself out there. And I know that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. So if, if I can position these initiatives as the advocate um, and then create also training programs to help people build up some of those skills in a safe environment, then... I think we're on the right track. Yeah, I mean, the, it's it's interesting. There is a, a higher proportion of um, of introverts in the Asian population than, say, in the American population, which is 
hundred percent extra. No, I'm joking, <laughs> but I do feel like Americans just came out the womb knowing how to do public speaking. Definitely. But obviously, it is a skill that it requires a lot of practice, a lot of training. I think they're particularly good in the American education systems for training people for that sort of stuff. So I think it's great that you are able to impart some of your wisdom and lessons that you've learned um, as a as a female leader and a, and a public speaker that's sought after in the industry to uh, to the women in Asia. But I think we need to hear as well. And I might be talking out of turn. I'm in. Guys, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> well, you, I think you guys have like an eye on Saudi as well, don't you? And I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in the confidence and public speaking side, but also, you know, having the executive center presence there uh, at the same time. So uh, maybe the two go hand in hand. I don't know. I was unfairly just putting Middle East into Asia as part of our full remit from Australia all the way over to the Middle East, but I totally agree. Um, that's why I was so excited to hear your example of a, a, a women's based workplace. I mean, that's super exciting. We definitely don't have that in Hong Kong yet. Um, and I think that there is also, there are a lot of different organizations that are trying to, to be better at this, both from an internal corporate perspective, but also from an organizational perspective, um, but there's nothing that's tying them all together. So there's lots of silos still, right? So you've got, you know, women in finance Asia and you've got women's leadership initiative under ULI and you've got women of influence, which is only Hong Kong chapter of American Chamber, but like they don't talk to each other at all. So I'm also trying to find ways to build a larger community, um, particularly cross-regionally. And that includes, of course, um, the Middle East as well. Yeah, I think there's, there's some good work being doing for for, for for women wild i think is a good organization yeah, I, mean, I think that. there's a lot of women who, who are speaking here <clears throat> a lot yeah. of the panel discussions is, is it's uh, quite often it's all women so yeah it seems to be good here saudi i imagine is probably a good bit behind that but um yeah there is some some steps being taken yeah and if you do move into saudi there are some cultural nuances there as well for mm. the male and female divide in those sorts of spaces i think i've talked about this before in the on the podcast that uh, the lady spaces in Saudi are, are just significantly better than, than the men's because they have autonomy and control over those environments and uh, and they, they have more greenery and vegetation and life in those spaces and colour and vibrance and then you go to the, the gent side and it's just cubicles of mahogany and you're like yeah. <laughs> maybe we should let the ladies just be designing all these spaces because they seem to have got it kind of figured out to a, to a greater degree so on that and this is a big question and I get to ask this all the time so I'm just going to throw it out to you future of the office future of work what does it look like how does it function as well um in the next five ten years so you said that you know covid didn't change anything too dramatically for you guys but let's put it on a long enough time only from a design perspective yes. it changed lots of things yeah 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 but sorry just design sorry yeah <laughs> so on on the, on the subjects of design long enough timeline is it 10 years before we start to see anything radically different from where we are now or is it 15 or is it 20 what are your thoughts on the future of work 10 years i think we're seeing change already yeah i mean if i asked you how many days do you go to office in a week what's your answer um well i work from home predominantly i've just started my own organization <laughs> so. well, yeah. what about okay what about you yeah, well i'm there a lot yeah i mean i'm i'm in the office every day and maybe not for the full day but i'm there yeah most days um, see so that's that's a really good example about how the questions that we're asking are not evolved enough to give us a holistic picture of what's actually happening. Because if somebody asked me, which they have, how many days do you go to the office? My answer is also every day, yeah. but it's never all day, or I should say very infrequently all day, every day. And it's almost never the same office all day, every day, right? Because sometimes I have calls at seven in the morning, so I take them at home. You know, and then I go to the office. I go to my head office because that's where my team is based. That's where our C-suite sits. Um, and then I leave. And then I go to one of our offices in Hong Kong because that's more convenient to the people that I'm meeting, to the people that we are working with from a partnership perspective. Um, sometimes I'm traveling. So I work from our office in Dubai, for example, because that's where I am right now. Um, so I think that the questions that we're asking are too simple. Um, because when we're talking about hybrid, it's not just, do you work from home or do you work from your office? It's where else do you work? And also how frequently do you work? Cause hybrid also, it doesn't just mean from a location perspective, it's also about timing, right? Sure, yeah. Right. So like, do you, 
do you start your day at seven and end at four because you have other obligations? Or do you go surfing in the morning and so you start at 10, right? And so understanding those kinds of complexities, I think, are essential. And so when I see all of these, you know, big headlines, you know, XXX financial institution mandates everybody come back to the office three days a week, I'm like, if somebody told me you have to come back to the office three days a week, I'd be like, oh, sure, no worries. I'm already there. Mm -hmm. Right. So I Which think one specifically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Or are you do you mean I need to be there all day every yeah. day or do you mean I just need to come in for an hour and then I can go I'm back home or yeah. do something else? Right. So mm -hmm. I think when we talk about hybrid, which is where I think the future is going we need to really start to dive down into what that means. Um, and I think it's going to be really different for every region, every kind of organization. I mean, in Asia specifically, people were actually really excited to come back to the office. I mean, I had people on my team that were like, uh, no, thank you. I don't need to work from home. I'm not interested. Right. Yeah. There are a lot of factors why so that's the case. Yeah. But I mean, you also you know, create some of the best offices. Your business model is to be so awesome that people want to come. Right? Yes, that's also very true. But <laughs> most offices, that's not the business model. True, but it? still people wanted to come back. Why? Because in Asia, for example, a lot of people live in really small houses. Yep. Right? They don't have shared houses. Yeah. Shared house, like multifamily in literally multi generational living situations, not mm. multifamily housing, as you talk about from a corporate real estate perspective. Like you're in there with. Your spouse, your kids, your pets, your grandparents, sometimes, I mean, we're talking huge extended family and like, that's not really a conducive environment to having calls, doing work. So people are enthusiastically coming back to the office. I think you yeah. touched on, you know, cultural nuances earlier. Um, you know, I, I always laugh about in America how, you know, there, there's, the, there's been this huge reticence of like, how are we gonna get, nobody wants to come back. How are we gonna do this? And I think it's really, it's a different approach to, I guess, organizational structure, because, you know, in America, you, you have this idea of, you know, the American dream, you make your decisions, you, you can be the champion of your own life. So, you know, organization A says, come back to the office and you go, I don't think so. I'm out of here. I'd rather quit. Right. Well, you tell somebody in Asia that they're like, what? No way. Mm -hmm. Like if my company says I'm coming back, I'm coming back, you mm -hmm. know? And maybe I'm going to create a cohort and really try and, you know, advocate for change for different policies. But I haven't seen that same kind of pushback in this region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I suppose with like interest rates, mortgage prices going up in America, you kind of sat there thinking, I'm paying more for my mortgage, but I'm being told to spend more time away from it. And I really want to be like at home or have that flexibility, but I'm, I'm being forced to go back into the office. Anyway, that's by the by. We'll leave well, that there. I mean, people also like... <laughs> like they didn't just move from like, you know, the inner city to a, a neighborhood that's a little bit outside of the city. They moved from like New York City to like Florida. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden organizations like you got to come back to the office and you're like, I don't even like live in that jurisdiction anymore. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a six hour commute. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, if you move to, I imagine, a city like New York, part of the reason to move there is to network and to meet people. And if you're not going to the office, how do you do it? I I've had that in the UK moving to London and most of the network of people that I met was through my work and my office. So it's a social experience. And mm. for me, working from home there just wouldn't have been an option. Same for me. I mean, I moved to Hong Kong and I had like one peripheral friend, right? So literally everybody I know there is from going into the office, going to events, meeting different people through connections of friends of friends of friends. So yeah, for me, same thing, yeah. right? And I actually, it's interesting because I teach a, a course at a university in the U.S. called Collaborative Problem Solving. It's an undergraduate course for mostly juniors and seniors. And I always ask them, you know, at the end of the course, because most of them are going into their first sort of corporate workplace for the first time, you know, if you had a choice between an organization that said you need to come into the office five days a week, you don't have any option to work in other places, or one that says, you know, you're expected to be in the office, which means you need to live in a specific space, right? Because you need to come into a specific location. Um, but, you know, we only expect you to be there, you know, three days out of the week. Or a company that says, fully remote, go work wherever you want. 100% of them say option B. And when I asked why, they said, how, like, how am I supposed to make friends? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I'm leaving this community that I've been a part of for four years, sometimes with people that I've gone to school with since I was, you know, in kindergarten. Mm. And all of a sudden I'm expected to like 
make a whole new set of contacts. How am I supposed to do that if I don't go into an office? So that's why I've always been very, very confident that the office is around forever. Yeah. It's just the, what you do in the office, which I know is what you talk about a lot. You know, that's going to change. <laughs> yeah. So I have one final question. I think we're probably going a bit over time anyway, but I'll, I'll get it in there because I know how important this is to Horton. Um, also, we have like COP28 coming this year. Sustainability features heavily in what, what Horton Interiors does. It's a big part of uh, what I'm interested in promoting as well. And it seems to me that the business model is around occupancy and utilization. Whereas in most organizations, they really struggle to, you know, get like above 70. Whereas, you know, if you're at 70, that's a, that's a failing, um, that's a failing office for the executive center, right? So you said the Dubai office is a hundred percent capacity, um, Abu Dhabi roughly hundred percent. And that's why you get the, the second, uh, facility in Abu Dhabi as well. Um, so do you think that this business model of, of co-working of, of, of flex is ultimately the way that we should be going in general anyway, like just for sustainability reasons so that we can ensure that those spaces are highly occupied and utilized? That's a great question. I think, again, sorry, I'm giving lots of yeses and nos at the same time. I think that having an understanding of the flex industry and how it, the place that it fits within a larger corporate real estate strategy is hugely important, right? Because it's not a one size fits all solution. A lot of organizations, it actually makes sense for them to have their own offices, have what's considered a traditional office. I mean, some some organizations own the whole asset, right? So of course it probably makes sense for them to put their employees in there. Um, but even with the traditional leasing model, if you're super confident about you know your position within a specific location and you, you don't feel like you're speculating on your growth more or less, then yeah, maybe you feel confident to sign a, a 10 year lease and it's not gonna be an issue. But then what happens if you suddenly do have a new project team? That's where the flex piece comes into play, right? And if you're building a corporate real estate strategy that has that sort of, that product and service incorporated in the beginning, as opposed to being that sort of band-aid solution at the end, then you're gonna be in a much better place. So I, I think that we would never, I don't think that we'll ever see like 100% of corporate real estate being flexible offices. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think JLL had a report that said about 30% of all global real estate will be flex spaces by 2030. And on average, when we talk to landlords, that's kind of what they're saying. You know, they want 20% of their asset to be flexible in some way. But one of the things that we're seeing now, which is really interesting, is, you know, partnering with the developers to, you know, manage spaces for them that they've created as an asset or an amenity for their tenants, right? So I really like the, the direction that we're going in terms of creating full circle partnerships as opposed to these sort of siloed conversations where it's like, developer builds building, puts tenants in. We say we really want to be in that building. So they go, okay, sure, we'll put you in there too. But they don't really care like that. We're, we're just looked at as another one of those tenants. Now it's much more integrated where a development is happening. The developer comes to us and says, I really think having a flex space in this building is going to be a benefit to the rest of the tenants. Will you guys come in and build a space there? And then then already now you're creating this circular. Like we've seen where they've earmarked specific areas for this now, yeah. so they're really thinking about it. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and then that comes back to your question about sustainability, right? Because then if a landlord can say to a tenant, look, take a half a floor instead of a full floor because you don't need an event space, you don't need a conference room, you don't need 10 meeting rooms, right? Because two floors below you, there's this really premium, super reliable, flexible workspace that has all of that in there. And you can just book it through their app whenever you need to. Mm. Boom, right? Now now you're really thinking about how to utilize all those spaces in the most efficient sort of way. Mm. Thank you for coming on. It's been great to see you. you and, um, and you've given some great insight to our audience. So thank you so much for your time. It was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolute <laughs> pleasure. Super happy to be here and nice to see you again. Well, too. next time you're in town, hope to have you on again. For sure. <laughs>